London. In the 21st century, London is a busy, modern, international capital, with all the traits of a sophisticated, up-to-the-minute, connected conurbation. Evidence of its modernity is simply everywhere, from the stylish high-rise to the transport infrastructure, which is being updated all the time, to the way this capital leads in the fields of popular culture, fashion, filmmaking and lifestyle. But appearances can be deceptive. Despite all this ultra-modern architecture everywhere, London has a really rich history dating right back to Roman times and before. And at its heart, the city has a dark medieval presence. And that's because just about 1,000 years ago, this city went through a major upheaval. And for the only time in its history since those days, London was invaded and it was transformed by a force of hard-minded warriors whose brutal behaviour totally shaped the character of this place. The Norman invaders put their stamp on London and made sure that no one ever again was going to get away with what they had achieved. But you have to hand it to them because the building that most symbolises their rule of law or should I say their rule of terror, is still here today. Right at the heart of the city is the Tower of London. You would have thought by the 16th century when this building was over 500 years old and we had enjoyed five centuries of life without invasion in this country, that a certain order, a sense of law and justice would have been established. It was, but sometimes civilization can appear to be only wafer thin. In 1690, a member of the English parliament opened his front door one day to find a gruesome sight. A corpse had been nailed to his door as a warning. The grim message came from Judge George Jeffreys. The judge was in charge of justice during the short reign of King James II. The unpopular King James was perceived as arrogant and seemed to have contempt for the law the king would allow no criticism of himself or his Catholic faith. To carry out his authoritarian policies, James needed a strong enforcer who didn't mind if the law got in his way. Often drunk in court, Judge Jeffreys had a reputation as an abusive and abrasive figure who matched the king's disregard for the finer points of law. While Charles II was still on the throne, Jeffreys took over the prosecution of the Rye House plotters who were charged with treason after planning to kill the king. One prosecutor said that he could not see there was enough evidence to convict the enemies of the crown. But Jeffreys disagreed and using controversial and ruthless methods condemned the men to their deaths. One even killed himself, slitting his own throat while awaiting sentence in the tower. That was in 1683. Next to the king, Jeffreys was effectively the most powerful man in England. He used the legal bench to condemn anyone who was foolish enough to voice even the most mild of criticism or complaint about King James or the Catholic Church even though he was a Protestant himself. Oh, you've got to save yourself. Please, Father, please. Just give me a oh, You're me. lying. Listen. No, I'm not you're lying. guilty. Give me the gun. Take him away. Please. He draped the walls of his kangaroo court in blood-red tapestries and terrified anyone who was brought before him. Silence! Silence! There's no 
such plea as not guilty in my court. You're all guilty. Take that rabble away. With every new execution, opposition to Jeffreys and the King grew. The King's enemies grew bolder and searched for someone to replace the King. They finally turned to the King's nephew, the Duke of Monmouth. As the illegitimate son of the late King Charles, Monmouth had royal blood. He was also a Protestant, which would bring religious peace. And what's more, Monmouth hated his uncle, the King. So driven more by ambition than sense, Monmouth seized the offer to unseat the King. But despite his best efforts to raise popular support, Monmouth's cause did not receive widespread acclaim. And after a stuttering military campaign, he was defeated by the King's troops in the West Country and brought to London for execution. The handsome young Duke had no alternative but to flee and fear for his life. With Monmouth defeated, but in his absence, Judge Jeffreys charged him with high treason. To make his point, Jeffreys added his own personal postscript to sentencing. Monmouth, may you rot in hell. <laughs> Two days later, Monmouth was captured and Jeffreys immediately enforced his decision to execute him without any further justice. He was sentenced to the axe. A crowd gathered at Tower Hill to watch his grisly end. With solemn dignity, Monmouth walked through the crowd and mounted the black draped scaffold. Before kneeling, Monmouth felt the edge of the axe blade and as was customary, paid the executioner six coins to ensure the job was done cleanly and quickly. But this turned out to be wasted money. The Axeman, surprised by Monmouth's grace, lost his nerve and missed completely with his first stroke. Then, depending on which account you believe, rained either seven or eight wayward blows on Monmouth before pulling a large knife and finishing the job in a cack-handed bloody manner. The enraged mob stormed the scaffold and attacked the executioner. Word spread of the botched execution and further flamed the discontent against the king. Fearing a general rebellion, the king, and in particular Judge Jeffreys, moved fast to stamp out any flickers of rebellion. The arrested Monmouth supporters were brought to trial in Taunton in Devon, where a heavily drinking Jeffreys presided over what has become known as the Bloody Assizes. The judge in just over two months had over 320 men and women executed, with a further 840 sent to the West Indies on a life of slavery. Jeffreys bragged that he had hanged more men than all his predecessors since the Norman Conquest. His lawless rampage was out of control. The House of Lords now began to doubt his usefulness and openly questioned his actions in the chamber. Jeffrey's response was to nail corpses to their front doors. Supporting Jeffreys, King James simply suspended the legal system and disbanded Parliament. Public outrage now reached a breaking point. There was only one way to end the mayhem. In desperation, Parliament reached out to the Protestant Dutch King to invade England and end the reign of James. James fled his capital after barely three years on the throne. With his protector gone, Jeffreys was exposed, so ran for his life. He had made far too many enemies to survive for long. Disguised as a lowly sailor, he made his way to the London docks and bought his passage to France on a coal barge. 
but fate was not on his side. He was about to avoid justice, but while waiting for the boat to depart, he decided to take a drink in a tavern, the Red Crow, by the quayside. It turned out to be a costly drink. He was spotted by a clerk in the public house who Jeffreys had once sentenced to a whipping. His past was about to catch up with him. The judge was exposed. Only the police saved him from being pulled to pieces. But worse was to come. Ironically, the terrified Jeffreys begged to be taken to a safe place. The tower. But even the thick walls of the tower could not protect Jeffreys from public hatred. His victims were allowed into the tower to stare at the judge and hurl insults and worse at the broken man through the cell bars. Caged like an animal, he had to take the abuse. Knowing he was a drunk, Parliament instructed the guards at the tower to provide Jeffreys with all the brandy he could pay for. It turned out to be a suitable punishment. Four months later, abandoned and alone, Judge Jeffreys literally drank himself to death. Although Jeffreys had one of the highest posts in the country, he was by no means the most famous of the prisoners to be held in the tower. The best known of all the tower's mysteries concerns two young boys who officially, at least, were not meant to be prisoners at all. The princes in the tower were the two sons of Edward IV. Edward, who was the elder Prince of Wales, and Richard, Duke of York. When Edward IV died, Rather unexpectedly in 1483, Richard went with his mother to Westminster to sanctuary because they were safe there from any possible usurper or anyone who wished to take possession. But Edward was taken charge of by Richard, Duke of Gloucester, his uncle, Edward IV's brother, and brought into the tower on the grounds that he would there prepare for his coronation, which was the standard practice. So he wasn't held as a prisoner he was lodged in the royal palace within the tower. There was a suggestion that both boys were illegitimate because their father had made a prenuptial contract with Lady Eleanor Butler before his marriage. And under current law, that made them illegitimate. Richard then took the throne as Richard III. And the two boys were seen originally playing in the garden, looking out of the windows. But gradually, they were seen less and less. And from the late summer of 1483, they were not seen at all. And the suspicion grew that because Richard didn't produce them and didn't parade them through London, that they had died or been killed. And from that day, practically until this, there has been some doubt as to who was the instigator. Obviously Richard was the prime suspect because he had taken the throne and he was removing potential rivals who could be manipulated by uh, others and presented as legitimate monarchs. In 1502, 18 years later, Sir James Tyrrell, who was charged with treason on a completely unrelated matter. After he had been convicted, so he had nothing to lose, said that he had supervised the deaths of the two boys, that they had been smothered in their beds by two men who he had employed 
and that they had been buried within the tower. And then in the reign of Charles II, when work was being done close to the White Tower, a box with the bodies of two boys who were presumed to be more or less the same age as Edward IV's children would have been in 1483 was discovered, which seemed to lend credence to the fact that they were murdered, possibly in 1483 or soon afterwards. And the legend has, has hung on and it has been a major cause of uh, damaging the reputation of Richard III, who in other respects, many historians would say, would be, had been an effective king and had continued the Yorkist reforms which had been established by Edward IV. Richard III's death on the battlefield was followed by an almost orchestrated campaign to vilify him. And one of the grounds, of course, was the disappearance of the two boys. And the debate has resurfaced because Richard's body was rediscovered recently beneath a car park in Leicester, where he had been buried after the Battle of Bosworth. Conditions within the Tower for prisoners varied depending on their status and on the politics of the time. But there were no small cells. They were lodged in the rooms in the towers around the curtain wall. And the royal prisoners would have been lodged in the royal palace, which was still functioning as a royal palace. So the conditions were not onerous and not necessarily restrictive for senior prisoners. I think some of the lesser prisoners probably had a more difficult time. But someone of status would have been treated quite well and quite comfortably. And they had to pay for their upkeep. And so obviously the better off that they were, the better the standard of upkeep. And they could take their own servants in with them and receive visitors. When Thomas More was a, a prisoner, um, he chose as the one servant that he was allowed, a man who was used to supplying and arranging paper, pen and ink. And so he spent part of his time, until these were taken away, he spent part of his time writing, I mean scholarly works, as well as justifying his own position. So Thomas More, to a certain extent, was able to continue his life as a writer, a theological writer, which he had been practicing before. And Sir Walter Raleigh was able to write a quite monumental history of the world, of which we only have the first volume because he didn't go on to write the second volume. So he wrote the history of the ancient world while he was in the tower, while he was lodged in, in the bloody tower. The gunpowder plot, the discovery of the gunpowder plot was such a shock to the establishment and to the system that Guy Fawkes, who was the person who was apprehended on the spot with the gunpowder, I mean, he had no legal defence, uh, he was brought to the tower and he was almost certainly tortured uh, to find out the absolute essence of the plot. But in fact, the other conspirators were quickly rounded up, some in London and some were pursued out into the provinces, into the Midlands, and they were not tortured. But Guy Fawkes' signature from the point where he was a free man to the point where he'd been imprisoned in the tower uh, changes considerably. It's a very shaky hand, which signs is, is a later admission. Through the centuries, those who were trapped in the Tower of London fought to get out. Now the tower is one of the world's best known tourist attractions, not least this is because it houses the most well-known and priceless collection of jewels and artefacts known to man. They're called the Crown Jewels. Her Majesty the Queen opened the present display of the Crown Jewels in 1994. The actual collection of crowns, scepters, orbs and ceremonial objects are kept in a vault deep in the tower guarded with tight security. Every day Thousands of tourists inspect the crown jewels and many visitors often ask how much that collection is worth. The answer is that the crown jewels are worth nothing for they are simply priceless. Encrusted with rare gems, the royal crown itself is worn only on state occasions and then returned to its permanent home. It's said that some of the stones that make up the crown jewels 
exert a strange and mystical power. The Koenol diamond, seen here set in the crown of Queen Elizabeth at their coronation, is set to carry a strange curse. The famed stone has been fought over for 2,000 years. In 1739, the Shah of Persia invaded India, searching for the Koenol diamond, then owned by the Mughal Emperor. Despite a brutal ransacking, the diamond could not be found. Eventually, after being tortured, one of the Emperor's harem revealed that the Emperor hid the diamond in his turban. The Shah invited the Emperor to a feast and suggested they cement the peace by exchanging turbans. Retiring to a room, the Shah unwrapped the Emperor's turban and out spilled the priceless stone. He exclaimed, Koinor, which means mountain of light in Persia. The huge diamond came to Britain in 1850 during British rule of the subcontinent. It was presented to Queen Victoria, who had this stone recut and placed in the new crown but no male member of the royal family has ever worn it because legend states that men who possess it suffer misfortune while women who own the diamond will rule the world. Stealing the crown jewels from the Tower of London has long been one of the ultimate criminal challenges. No one has ever done it, but one man came very close indeed. A rogue named Colonel Thomas Blood was tempted to steal the jewels and actually came to hold the crown in his hands. But strangely enough, he did not have to pay the consequences for his audacious crime. In early September 1680, a group of men dug up the body of Colonel Thomas Blood in the London graveyard. They wanted to make sure he was really dead. Colonel Blood had brazenly broken into the Tower of London and actually held the crown in his hands. How he stole the crown jewels and nearly got away with it is one of the biggest riddles in the tower's history. When King Charles II took back the crown from Parliament and ended Cromwell's protectorate, to symbolise his power, the newly thrown king had ordered that new crown jewels should be made. But this collection of jewels would soon be the target of a brave crime. Needing more than jewels to show his power, King Charles purged rebels and their sympathisers. One of the victims of the King's campaign was Colonel Thomas Blood. As a rebel supporter, Colonel Blood's money, house and land were confiscated by the King's agents. He was left a broken man. Bitter, looking for revenge and out to regain his fortune, Colonel Blood planned attacks on the King's supporters. The Colonel was prone to outlandish schemes that always seemed to be jinxed, but in lucky twists of fate, he always seemed to survive. He organised an attack on Dublin Castle, hoping to take the King's representative prisoner and hold him for ransom. Days before the plot was due to be put into action, the entire affair unravelled. Dozens of conspirators were arrested, tried and executed. Despite a large reward for his capture, Colonel Blood was able to get away. Blood escaped to England under an assumed name. With several failed schemes behind him, the hapless Colonel was broke and desperate. Finally, he hatched a plot as bizarre as it was elaborate. Colonel Blood proposed to steal King Charles's new crown jewels. Blood learned that the jewels were kept in the lower dungeon of the jewel house, where a retired military officer named Talbot Edwards looked after them. Edwards was the master of the jewels, and his main job was simply to guide visitors who wanted to see the collection. Edwards and his family lived in an apartment above the royal vaults. Launching his scheme, Colonel Blood disguised himself as a reverend and enlisted a female accomplice who pretended to be his wife. Together, they visited the tower under the pretext of visiting the crown jewels. Once the pair were at the tower, the gullible Talbot Edwards welcomed them 
and led them to the vaults and the precious gems. Inside the jewel vault, Blood's plan began to swing into action. The accomplice playing his wife faked illness and when she pretended to faint, Edward suggested she be taken to somewhere more comfortable to recover. Falling nicely into Blood's scheme, the kindly Edwards suggested that the lady be taken to his own apartment where she could be tended by his wife. Several days later, Colonel Blood returned to the tower with gifts for Mrs. Edwards as a repayment for her kindness. And so began a friendship between the two couples. The phony reverend relentlessly pursued a friendship with Edwards for all it was worth. The families frequently dined together and on one occasion, Blood brought along a young man he introduced as his nephew. In fact, the nephew was a partner in crime, brought in to case the tower. Blood told Edwards that the accomplice had a friend who wanted to see the jewels when he came to London. The Colonel claimed that the friend could not wait until the tower was properly open, but needed to come at a weekend because he had to leave for urgent business elsewhere. In reality, of course, the friend was another member of the robbery team. Edwards gladly made special arrangements and arranged for them to be at the tower just before 7am the following morning. On the night of May the 8th, 1671, Colonel Blood and his accomplices made their final preparations. They each carried a sheathed short dagger. Blood took several pistols and a wooden mallet. And one of the gang carried a fire. Just before dawn, they set off for the tower. One guarded the horses, while the other two put their plan into action. Nervously, they made their way across the courtyard. Hiding their weapons, blood led them to the entrance to the jewel vault. The unsuspecting Edwards led them on. The would-be robbers were now within sight of the most lucrative robbery the world had known. As the massive iron gate swung open, Blood drew the mallet and struck Edwards across the head. The master of the jewels fell screaming and struggling. In the scuffle, one of the gang drew a dagger and stabbed Edwards, while the others rushed through the door. Colonel Blood smashed the crown, shoving the crumpled remnants into an old leather bag. Everything was going according to plan. Nothing but an easy escape stood between the gang and unimaginable riches. But Blood's curse seemed to strike again. The thieves almost bumped into Edward's son on their way out. He had unexpectedly stepped right into the middle of the robbery. With young Edwards and a tower guard in hot pursuit, the thieves scrambled away and into the maze of the winding tower. Colonel Blood and his accomplices crossed the open courtyard towards the tower drawbridge and freedom beyond. Blood's outlandish scheme was about to unravel though. One by one, the thieves were taken down. Only Blood remained free, and as he dashed towards the escape, his path was blocked by a guard. In a last-ditch bid to escape, he drew a pistol, but as the gun went off, the guard dodged the bullet, and Blood was brought down. Another scheme bit the dust. Blood was dragged back into the tower, where he waited to face a trial for treason and the inevitable death sentence. It looked like Blood's luck had finally run out. 
but by the end of the day, news of the astonishing plot had spread across London and, of course, to King Charles. But this is where the story gets curiouser and curiouser. The King reacted oddly. He insisted on meeting Blood and seemed intrigued to find out how the plot had been hatched. No one knows what words passed between the King and his would-be robber, but within days of this strange meeting, Colonel Thomas Blood was released from his cell and with a full royal pardon. Even more amazingly, Colonel Blood was granted a lordly pension of £500 a year for life. He'd wriggled out of trouble yet again. Though Colonel Blood might have amused King Charles, no one else understood it. A number of rumours flashed around the capital that Blood had become a spy for the King, that he tested the tower's security, or perhaps he was simply a charming con man. No one will really know for sure. And people did not even believe it when the news of Blood's death was announced on August the 24th, 1680. It was as if he was trying one last trick and had faked his own death. To settle the question, a London coroner ordered the body to be exhumed from its resting place. Was he really dead? But it appeared that the grave was one place that Blood was not about to escape from. The walls of the tower have withstood a thousand years of deadly struggles and treacherous plots, attempted invasions, the overthrow of monarchs. The tower stands as a fierce symbol of royal might and a reminder of the tragic fate that befell those that attempted to challenge the king's power. Now only the ravens that live in the tower are confined to these ancient walls. And legend has it that if the birds depart, the tower and kingdom will fall. The tower warders, who often tell the stories of the tower to the visitors, are used to hearing most questions from their audience. But the beef eaters were shocked one day in 1991, when after a tour of the ancient blood-soaked alleys of the tower, a middle-aged woman stepped out of the crowd. She approached the guide and asked quietly, can you show me the place where they shot my father? The woman's question revealed the tragic story of her father, the last man to be executed in the tower. His name was Joseph Jacobs, a German spy who was supposed to guide enemy planes over England during World War II. To ensure the skies were clear enough for the planes to find their targets, the German Air Force needed constant updates on the unpredictable English weather. The only way of getting this information was to have it transmitted out of England by someone on the inside, one of their German spies. Spying is dangerous work and most are highly trained professionals, but Joseph Jacobs was a poorly trained amateur who was just a pawn in the deadly game of wartime intelligence. Jacobs was a dentist and had already served in the German military in the First World War. But at the age of 42, he was again drafted into the German army. In a bureaucratic blunder, Jacobs was ordered into the German secret service. He was given three weeks training in radio communications and meteorology, but he received no special training as an espionage agent. Jacobs was considered totally expendable and was supplied with a radio transmitter hidden in a briefcase, some road maps of England and a set of false identity papers. He was also given a pistol, but no lessons on how to use it. With these simple tools, the dentist would be airdropped into England to establish a clandestine weather service. In the heart of enemy territory, the amateur spy was to radio regular reports 
to Nazi headquarters. Slipping into British airspace under cover of darkness, Jacobs parachuted into Huntingdon, England on January the 31st, 1941. Not only was Jacobs not a real spy, but he was far from an experienced parachutist with only minimal training. He landed on farmland, but shattered his ankle in so doing, a painful and immobilizing injury that would cost him dear. He tried to escape and painfully hobbled to the nearest outbuilding. Hungry and tormented by his injury, he forgot any training he might have had and surprised the farmer's wife. Terrified, she tried to raise the alarm. Jacobs tried to silence her by brandishing the pistol and limping after her. It was fruitless and useless. Hungry and in terrible pain, exhausted and panicking, Jacobs dragged himself back to his landing site. In pain and clueless as to what to do next, he just gave up the will to continue as a spy and fired his pistol in the air to attract some help. A farmhand working nearby heard the shots and discovered the unlikely sight of the parachute spread across one of the fields. And beside it was Jacobs lying unconscious. Jacobs was taken into custody where he denied he was working for the Germans, but came up with no reasonable explanation. His cover story was completely forgotten. Did he really think they would take pity on him and just let him go home? He'd been caught red-handed with a forged ID, a radio transmitter, a Luger pistol, and maps of the area showing two nearby airfields. They all told the story pretty clearly. By now, his injury was so bad, the reservists had to put him on a stretcher before driving him to London to await his fate. After his ankle was repaired, he was sent to an internment centre where he was questioned. But the hapless dentist just couldn't work out what to say next. Under wartime conditions, he was brought before a military court and tried as a spy. During the trial, he claimed he was a native of Luxembourg, helped Jews escape from Germany and had even been in a concentration camp himself for his anti-Nazi activities. But that was all unsupported by any evidence. On the other hand, Swiss police records showed he'd been sent to prison in 1924 for selling counterfeit gold, and that he had, in fact, charged some Jewish families exorbitant amounts to get them out of Germany. Jacobs looking at the death penalty. During the Second World War, spies were normally hanged in the ground of the prison. But Jacobs could not stand on the hangman's gallows because of his shattered ankle. 
he would have to be shot by a firing squad. The agony for Jacobs was further prolonged when the arrangements for the execution had to be changed. Jacobs prison did not have a military firing squad, so the prisoner had to be transported to the Tower of London, where soldiers on active duty could do the job. So Jacobs was transferred to those historic cells to meet his appointment. seven o'clock on the morning of August the 15th 1941 a truck carrying the crippled dentist comes spying wound through the maze of the tower's alleyways finally drawing up at the Mendel rifle range on the outskirts of the tower's grounds as Jacobs was carried out a guard pinned a small black target over his heart Piles of hay were stacked against the back wall, and in front was a small wooden chair. An officer removed Jacob's glasses and placed a black hood over his head. The firing squad, six members of the Scots Guards, filed quietly across the entrance to the shed. Each soldier carried a Springfield rifle. One rifle carried a blank cartridge. It was all over very quickly. At 7.12 a.m., Joseph Jacobs was pronounced dead. The German dentist, who became a spy, entered the history books as the last in a long line of the Tower of London's victims. Like some implement of medieval torture, the bullet-riddled chair in which Jacobs met his fate still survives. Kept as a historical artefact, the chair remains safely in storage. It will remain hidden so it no longer haunts the descendants of Joseph Jacobs, the last victim of the tower. And his remains, will they remain securely inside the Tower of London?